transformation about how we can be changed into the image of Christ and how as believers, according to the Bible, we become new creatures in him. All things pass away, all things become new. But I think sometimes that can be a little bit um, uh, confusing to us because we think, well, if I'm so new, then why do I still act so old? Why, you know, if all things have passed away, why do I still do old things? And the thing is, is we are in a process called transformation, which actually means complete change. And it's interesting because we all crave and want and need change, and yet most of the time we're really, really afraid of it. <laughs> you know, we, we're done with the old, we don't want the old, we want the new, but yet somehow we're afraid to let go of this old thing because we're not real sure what the new thing is going to be yet. The thing that we always have to realize, and it took me so long to learn this, but it was so helpful to me when I did, that Boy, when we're born again, mm, we receive the nature of God in us, but it comes as a seed. All the fruit of the Spirit is in you, but it's in you as a seed. And seeds have to be what? Watered. <laughs> and they have to take root. And then after they take root, they will eventually begin to produce fruit. And so I'll just tell you ahead of time, if you're going to be impatient and want everything right this moment, and if you're not willing to make any investment of time or study or put any effort or energy into anything, you may go to heaven, but you will not have victory here in this life and you won't really enjoy the journey. And chances are your life will not be much of a witness to anybody else. Because if there's anything that the world needs, I don't know so much that it's another sermon that they need. Sermons are great, and I'll continue to preach sermons. But what they really need is to see the witness of changed lives and people with peace and people that are joyful and people that walk in love and people who can actually have a testimony and say, this is what happened to me. But now over these period of years, God has worked in my life and I can say that I'm free. A woman asked me the other night, she said, well, are you really free from all that? She said, I mean, like, are you really free? And I said, yes. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that I never have anything that I have to deal with from my past because there are certain things that I still do have to deal with. But freedom is not ever having to deal with anything. It's understanding what you're dealing with. Now listen to me. It's understanding what you're dealing with and being able to say that's fear and I'm not going to bow down to it. It's not that I never feel fear, but I don't have to let it control me anymore like I did all the years that I was growing up. And so what I'm trying to teach you this weekend is that you can be completely changed. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and that sin nature was passed on to all the rest of us, Seems like a bad deal, I know, but, you know, it kind of gets fixed whenever Jesus did everything right, and that gets passed on to us. So, uh, God did fix it, amen? And what he wants for us, really, is to totally return and be able to go back to his original plan for us, which was to be blessed and to walk in victory and to be a blessing and to enjoy God and to enjoy our lives and to have peace and joy and good relationship with him. Let's look at Isaiah 42, 22. But this is a people robbed and plundered. <laughs> Everybody say, I've been robbed. <laughs> this is a people robbed and plundered. They are all of them snared in holes and hidden in houses of bondage. <laughs> And they have become a prey with no one to deliver them, <clears throat> a spoil with no one to say, restore them. So I'm here today to say that God is in the business of restoration. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And I have good news for you in case you've never heard it before. God can completely and totally restore you and bring you back to a position better than you ever would have been if you would have never messed your life up. Dare to believe that no matter how long you've had a problem, that with God, all things 
are possible. Amen? Amen. The only thing that never changes is God. But he's in the business of changing everything else. Isaiah 61, 7 and 8 are a couple of scriptures that, man, these scriptures kept me. Whew, I used to turn to these things so often when I was going through hard times. What a great promise. Instead of your farmer's shame, you shall have a twofold recompense. That word means reward. How many of you know what it's like to, to have shame in your life? See, I, was, I had a shame-based nature because my dad had abused me. It wasn't even so much about what he did to me. I became ashamed of myself thinking something was wrong with me. And boy, the devil loves to get that message rooted in your head. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You ever, does anybody else have a copy of that record? <laughs> that may be the best-selling record of all times. What's wrong with me? And the first thing that Jesus gives us is, what's right with me? He that knew no sin became sin that we might be made as a gift of God by his grace, the righteousness. Because the devil wants you to do nothing but think about what's wrong with you and concentrate and focus all the time on your faults. And the more you focus on your faults, it just gives them more and more strength over you. I'm not going to tell you to break bad habits. I'm going to tell you to farm new habits. And when you work with the Holy Spirit on farming new habits, then there's no place in your life for the bad habits. I'm not going to tell you, don't you walk in the flesh. <laughs> I'm going to say, walk in the Spirit. And you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You don't have to get up every day and try real hard not to be mean and not to be mad and not to be in pain. <laughs> What you do is say, God, I want to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit today. Help me follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because if you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, then you won't walk in the flesh. And thankfully, when you do, when you make a mistake, you can receive forgiveness and just go right on. Because remember, God already loves you before you ever start trying to do better. Instead of your farmer shame, you'll have a twofold recompense. Instead of dishonor and reproach, your people shall rejoice in their portion. Here it comes. Therefore, in their land, not just when they die and go to heaven, <laughs> in their land they shall possess double what they forfeited, and everlasting joy shall be theirs. And I tell you, when I was going through the process of working with God to let him change me, which I might as well just tell you, it can sometimes be quite traumatic and painful. How many of you know that? All right. I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, just say, well, God changed me. No. I want you to say that. But I also want you to realize that there may be some days where you're going to feel like you've just been dropped over the belly of hell. And nobody understands what you're going through. You don't even understand what you're going through. And you're halfway in between where you were and where you want to be, and you don't know how to go back, and you don't know how to go forward. And all you can do is just sit there and go, Oh, God. <laughs> Does anybody in the room know what I'm talking about? In this land, you will possess double what you forfeited. Now, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. It's like a representation of us being not saved, slaves to sin. 
God sent them a deliverer, Moses, for us, Jesus. And he brought them out that he might take them in to the promised land. But they didn't come right out of bondage right into the promised land. <laughs> they heard about the promised land. We hear about the promises of God. I'm quite sure you've heard about the promises of God, but if you get really honest, some of you might say, well, I've been hearing about this for 20 years, but if I'm honest, I'm like really not living in it. And that was the place that I got to when I said, God, what's wrong? And the Israelites came out of there, headed toward the promised land, but it took them 40 years to make an 11-day journey. And God spoke through Moses and said, you dwelt long enough on this mountain. So could I just say to you this morning with all love and respect, some of you have been at the same dumb place way too long. I mean, you've wasted enough of your life feeling guilty today over what you did wrong yesterday. Now, I don't want you just not to care about what you did wrong yesterday, but guilt is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. And sadly, and I know this sounds totally crazy, but of the original group that came out, which were thousands and thousands of people, only two men... Now, there were children born out there that went into the promised land, but of the original thousands that came out, only two, Joshua and Caleb, actually crossed the Jordan <laughs> and went in. And I think that's indicative of how many Christians actually really ever enter the promised land and live the life. Now, what am I talking about when I say live the life? I'm not talking about having everything you want. I'm not even talking about... Uh, financial wealth, I'm talking about knowing who you are in Christ, knowing the power that's available to you as a believer. I'm talking about doing something worth doing with your life. I'm talking about other people coming into the kingdom because you're alive and breathing. I'm talking about joy and peace and, and being stable and, and your emotion is not ruling you and controlling you all the time. I'm talking about not needing to hate somebody because they hurt your feelings. These are the real victories that we need. It's not more stuff that we need. God will take care of the stuff. You seek the kingdom, God adds the things. And the kingdom is not things. It's these spiritual truths that I'm talking about. There's a lot of rich people that are very, very, very miserable. But the thing that people really fail to understand, I think, is the word possess. What does it mean when I say possess the land? What did God mean? Well, the word possess means to occupy by dispossessing the current occupants. So in other words, the land that belongs to you, there's a nasty little demon who's parked on it. And that demon may come through, you know. Oh, so like for example, one of the things that I had a real problem with was, man, I would just, I just did not handle it well when I would have to deal with anybody who had a personality that was just like my dad's was. Do you realize that there's certain people we back away from? And we really should be able to deal with everybody, still follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, do what we believe God's asking us to do. But boy, when it came to him or anybody with his personality, I would just like... I mean, Dave even told me after we were married a few years, he said, you get around your dad and you act like a totally different person. It was because I had fear and I had fear of that strong, manipulative, controlling personality. 
And so I got into this pattern in life where either I had to be in control or somebody was controlling me. So I never had balance because both of those are weird. I'm off the wall and not what God wants. Amen. How many of you have to deal with somebody controlling and manipulating in your life? Okay. So see, the, the thing to really be able to do is to just to say, you know, look, I love you, but you're not going to control me. But if we have those fears, we can't do that. Okay, so I'm over here saying, God, I want to be free. So I'm coming into the promised land. I get over here, and here's a person with my dad's exact personality sitting on my piece of ground. <laughs> So I can either run back to the wilderness <laughs> Okay, now listen Anything you run from is going to be waiting for you somewhere else The only way out is through Let me say it again The only way out is through. Before David could become king, he had to stand up to Goliath. <laughs> and so instead of running away and avoiding people like that, if I wanted to have this area of freedom that Jesus died to give me, I had to... So one day I was praying and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I want you to go confront your father. Oh. And then he said, but not, not yet. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want you to have it in your head that the time's going to come and I'll have you prepared. It still didn't make it easy. When the time came and God told me to go do that, and I went down, my dad was sitting in a recliner. I had never confronted him about what he did to me. And my mother's running around the house and she's already been in a mental institution for several years because she hid from what he was doing to me, so I'm trying to protect her and confront him. And, and it was just like a nutty situation. And I was shaking so hard. Just because God tells you to go do something doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. But the only way that you are free is when you press through and you do what God wants you to do and you get on the other side of it. He changes us little by little from glory to glory. And what I want you this morning is don't be mad at yourself because you've not arrived. Just be happy that God hasn't given up on you and you're still in the process. Amen? Oh yes, some of you have some people in your life right now that 
or sandpaper to you. Whoa. Honey, I tell you what, I would move away from them, move next door to two more just like them. It's like, I mean, when God's after you, you might as well give it up. You are not getting away. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and do not be ensnared again in a yoke of bondage which you've once put off. Why does that happen? Because sometimes we are under layers. layers and layers of things and because the Holy Spirit knows the exact time he gets us to a certain point and while we're relaxing whoa. <laughs> I've made it <laughs> yes thank you God you're so good then all of a sudden you don't know what happened you wake up some morning and whew. I mean you got every negative thought you could possibly have I mean yesterday you were godly into this morning you hate everybody I mean yesterday you were giving lessons on not judging other people this morning everybody you look at you were no, you're this and you're not bad and you're this come on am I right And of course, the devil wants you to think you backslid, you've opened the door for the devil, maybe you're not even saved after all. <laughs> What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And we need to realize that we're under attack. There's still a little place somewhere that the enemy can get in, and God's about to take care of that one too. If we just stand firm and keep our trust in God. I don't understand what's going on, but I want your will in my life, and I'm expecting you to take care of this. Amen? Now, the best thing to do is set your mind today that you're in a healing process. And that the number one thing that you need to do is follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And some of you think, well, I don't know how to hear from God. Well, actually, that's not true because the Bible says my sheep hear my voice. You may not recognize the voice of God, but you do hear from God. And the wisest thing to start saying is, I hear from God. Amen. I am led by the Holy Spirit. I hear from God. And then start asking God to teach you.
that he's trying to speak to you. Sometimes God speaks to us to, through another person and we don't want to hear from them. <laughs> Ain't God. Because that's not what we expected. And sometimes we can't hear God speak because we want to hear yes and he says, mm-mm. Well, that's another whole series, though. <laughs> Set yourself to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and understand this. God won't necessarily lead you the way he leads everybody else. So if you want to be led by the Holy Spirit, you may have to step out of the pack once in a while and do something that people are going to judge you and criticize you for or have an opinion about you. I don't think we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be addicted to people approval. And I'm not talking about being belligerent and rebellious. I'm, I think if we really love one another, we will encourage one another to be led by the Spirit. I'm not going to say to you, look, I'm having this Bible study at my house and this prayer meeting every Wednesday at 6 o'clock and I feel God wants you to come. And so then you say to me, well, I don't really feel like that's what God wants me to do. And now I'm judging you and criticizing you and mad at you because you're not doing what I thought God wanted you to do. What we should say is, I'd love to invite you to come. I'd love to have you there. You pray about it. And if you feel led to come, we'd love to have you. But then if you come back and say, I don't really feel like that's what God wants me to do, then you should say, great, I want you to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> don't try to make somebody your, do your thing just to validate what you're doing. <laughs> well, if I'm choosing to do this and now everybody else gets on my boat and does it too, now that assures me that I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit because he will never lead you to a wrong place. He'll lead you into wholeness and fullness and completeness and restoration.